Welcome to the webinar, uh, The Impact of Pesticide on Farm Workers and Rural Communities. Uh, and I'm really happy to be here and co-hosting this in collaboration with uh, Pan Europe. Uh, and thank you for all Pan Europe team uh, to have organized this, uh, this seminar. Um, I will let perhaps Martin uh, take a few words on uh, the logistic of uh, this uh, webinar. So Martin, if you want. Thank you very much, Madame Arena. Um, yes, uh, just a few housekeeping information, please, uh, except for the speakers, please keep your videos turned off uh, and your microphones, of course. Um, we have interpretation in Spanish and in French, so you have to click on the button, button below on interpretation and you can choose your language. And um, last thing about questions. Uh, if you have questions, please put them in the chat. Uh, please make sure you only put questions, not comments, uh, so that we can uh, try to include the questions uh, in the Q&A session at the end of this meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin. And I must say that I, I, I will leave this uh, webinar at uh, 11.40. And so I will let you, Martin, uh, um, have the moderation of this uh, Q&A session and also the last word uh, for the conclusion. Unfortunately, I have to go to another meeting, but uh, we will continue to work together on this uh, very important issue uh, on which we are working for the moment at the European Parliament. So in advance, I thank you and I apologize myself not to be till the end of this webinar, but be sure that we will continue to work on it uh, after this webinar. So uh, when we uh, discuss discussing uh, about the use and impact of pesticides, it is often commonly argued that pesticides are safe if used according to certain recommendations and safety measures. However, recent scientific findings show that even when following strictly these recommendations, pesticide use still result in a significant exposure, which is linked to serious disease and disorders. Those most exposed are not surprisingly the farm workers who apply the pesticides, but also bystanders and residents of rural areas and their families. This is the reason why we are organizing this webinar today to warn about the health impact of pesticide use on farm workers as well as residents of rural areas. Today, scientists and experts will present the findings of their research on the health impact of pesticides, including their neurotoxic potential, the relationship between pesticide exposure and the development of Parkinson disease, the effect of exposures on children, and the ineffectiveness of the protective equipment in safeguarding the health of farm workers. With members of the European Parliament, we will discuss the urgent need to improve the current legislation in order to provide sufficient protection for exposure to pesticides. The webinar that we are uh, taking today takes take place when currently negotiating in the European Parliament on the Commission's sustainable use of plant protection product regulation proposal. It is not an easy negotiation, as you know, but we, we, we hope that we can land on this uh, negotiation as soon as possible to be sure that during this mandate, we will have a regulation on this. This legislation is a cornerstone for Europe to move away from pesticide dependency and towards a safer agriculture model that does not put at risk the health of farm workers and also the health of citizens. So this is the context in which we are discussing uh, today on this webinar. And I'm really, really happy to have uh, a very, uh, uh, very important panel of experts uh, being with us uh, uh, today to discuss on this. But first, of, uh, um, before having this discussion, I really uh, give the floor to Martin Dermin, who is an expert uh, also. Uh, but Martin Dermin is a veterinarian and holds a PhD on pathology as a beekeeper since, I think, 
at the age of 14. Uh, Martin is passionate about protecting the environment and citizens' health. He joined Pan-Europe in uh, 2012 to campaign for a ban on B-toxic uh, neonicotinoid, and he was appointed executive director of Pan-Europe uh, in 2022. So I'm really happy to give you the floor, Martin, uh, to, uh, to initiate this discussion on the webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Madame Arena. Um, thank you. So uh, Pan-Europe, for those who don't know us, uh, is an NGO, a health and environment NGO advocating jointly with our members towards a gradual replacement of synthetic pesticides with agroecological practices. Thank you. Um, and I wish to thank again Maria Arena for hosting this webinar and for her involvement in the protection of citizens' health and the environment against chemicals. Pan Europe proposed to organize this webinar because of the ongoing discussions around the SOAR, the Sustainable Use of Pesticides Regulation, as proposed by the European Commission. We welcome the objective to reduce pesticides by 50% until 2030, as well as the um, objective of the Commission to make integrated pest management, where pesticides are used as a last resort, a mandatory tool to help farmers becoming less dependent uh, on agrochemicals. As for all political files, we observe that there is a horse trading exercise where scientific evidence is disregarded. Citizens from rural areas are heavily exposed to pesticides and in particular farmers, farm workers, their families, as well as bystanders. A recent EU funded uh, SPRINT project has identified that some households in intensive agricultural areas contain more than 100 pesticide residues in dust. In parallel, more and more evidence shows that there is no safe use of synthetic pesticides. A substance that is considered safe today will be tomorrow identified as carcinogenic or harming the brain of our children. During the political discussions around the Commission proposal for a regulation on the sustainable use of pesticides, it is to us very surprising and also unacceptable that some interest groups or political parties that pretend to represent farmers keep opposing to any pesticide reduction, despite of the evidence on the harm caused by pesticides on rural communities. The impact of pesticides on rural communities is considerable and rural citizens also deserve to be properly represented and protected against such chemicals. With this webinar, we wish to bring back science into the debate and remind that pesticides do impact people's lives, generate dramas in families, disable people, including farmers and their children, not to speak about the, the health costs of pesticides. Without going any further into political considerations, it is time to give the floor to scientists and back to you, Madame Arena. Thank you, uh, Martin, and totally agree with you when you say that we need to have scientists on board when we are dealing with uh, these uh, very important topics um, and not an emotional way of uh, dealing with these topics. I think it's really important. So. Um, we will start directly with uh, Professor Mariana Fernandez. Uh, Maria Fernandez is a professor at the University of Granada, where she received a PhD, PhD in chemical science in 2001. She is also an expert in e epidemiology and clinical research for, from Andalus, Andalusian School of Public Health in 2004. Uh, Professor Fernandez leads a multidisciplinary research group of experts in human toxicology, clinicians, and epi epidemiologists, which pays special attention to the development of biomarkers of human exposure to endocrine, endocrine disruptors and the study of their effect on human health. Mariana, you have the floor for 15 minutes. Uh, so I don't know if it's in English or in Spanish, but we will have translation, so it's okay. So thank you. You have the floor. 
Thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation. I will present in English. Uh, uh, so um, I'm going to show all of you some of the data that my uh, group is producing in relation to non persistent pesticide and some health effect. Uh, today, we will talk about developmental neurotoxicity. Um, the, the, this specific work has been done uh, among children and uh, adolescent, Spanish adolescents from the general population. It's not a specific from rural or uh, farm uh, population. Um, next uh, slide, please. As probably you all know, Spain is uh, one of the countries in the European Union that occupies the first place in the consumption and the use of pesticides. And this is why we were very interested first to know what is the exposure to this specific contaminant and also to evaluate the, the exposure to uh, uh, this specific contaminant in relation to health effects among our children. And for this reason, we had evaluated the exposure um, using a, a multicenter and prospective um, bear cohort is the is called IMA environment and childhood is a very uh, well established Spanish bear cohort um, that recruit a mother a pregnant mother and their child in several areas of Spain. Um, uh, the, the data that I'm going to present today is uh, mainly in the sub cohort from the Granada province. I am in the University of Granada and leading this sub cohort with, within the IMA Spanish Bear cohort. Next slide, please. We um, selected the one. Um, pesticide priorities, prioritize in the European Union, Union. and specifically exposure to non-persistent pesticides such as organophosphate family, assessing a specific metabolites such as TCPI, IMP, MDA, and DTP. Also considering the sum of these four metabolites, from the pyrethroid family, we assessed three PBA and C DCCA under CHAM. Also, one Naptol, a metabolite of the carbamide family, and ETU, a metabolite of fungicide. Next slide, please. Residues of these pesticides were measured in the urine of 1,561 children and adolescents in the different follow-up of the cohort established between 2012 and 2019, when participants were between 8 and 16 years old. As you can see, ETU concentration were within previous reporting genes, IMP and DTP DC C shower, however, higher concentration and TCPI MDA 3 BPA and 1 M lower concentration. But as you can see, most of the children and adolescents shower exposure to many of the metabolite selected. Same for same. Uh, sorry, next slide. The same trend was observed for the detection frequency of these metabolites. Next. TCPI, that is a specific metabolite of chlorpyrifos, was mainly evident among the Valencian participants. As you probably know, Valencian is a uh, area of Spain for the cultivation of citrus fruit, orange, and limes. Chlorpyrifos 
is a pesticide used in the cultivation of this specific fruit. And its use in the food industry was banned in the Union, in the European Union in 2020. Next. It's not easy to establish a relationship between exposure to this specific pollutant and adverse health effects. For this reason, our research group used innovative tool that allowed us to identify intermediate events that occur between the exposure and the effect. For example, the brain derived neurotrophic factor to identify a value market that plays a key role in neurodevelopment. Its alteration of this protein has been linked to attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, autism spectrum disorder, and other neuro disease. Peripheral BDNF level correlate with central level and are age and sex dependent. Next. BDNF was assessed at three levels of biological organization. In the hot block, the methylation pattern of the BDNF gene at six CPGs in the exon form. Moreover, serum and urine total BDNF protein level were measured by ELISA assay using a very strict QAC, QA QAC protocol. Next. To evaluate the neurophysiological condition among participants, a comprehensive battery of tests were performed, as you can see, for both cognitive and behavioral function. Next. In the cross sectional study with children and adolescents of this of the Granada cohort in the, in the, in the IMMA co, uh, cohort, eight pesticide, pesticide metabolites were measured because all participants, all participants were exposed to a cocktail of compound, weighted quintile sum, WQS analysis, was conducted to assess the combined effect of all of them. Pesticides with the detection frequencies about 70% were selected for the mixture approach. IMP, MDA, DCCA, and ETU. Next. Next, thank you. IMP, TCP, I and the sum of the organophosphate metabolites sour significant dose dependent association with higher behavioral problem. ETU concentration from the DTO carbamide family sour and non dose response association with higher social problems. Next. In the regression iatric model with the organ of phase metabolite, including the total sum of all of them, pesticide sour association with lower BDNF protein level. Similarly, the carbamide metabolite N1 and the fungicide metabolite N ATU, sour association with lower BDNF protein level of different magnitudes. Next. Moderate and higher level of malathion, pyrethroids, and fungicide metabolites were related with increasing methylation percentage of the BDNF gene at several CPTGs and the total CPTGs methylation. Next, more important, when the combined effect of IMP, MDA, DCCA, and ETU was considered a possible association with withdrawal, 
social problem and fraud problem was found with MBA and IMP accounting with the higher ways. Remarkably, when MBA was considered individually, no statistical association were found, maybe due to an additive effect of the compound present in the urine of the adolescent. This model also revealed association with higher BDNF DNA methylation at CPD3 and total CPD DNA methylation with ATU and NDA showing the great influence of the mixture effect. Next, moderate and high serum BDNF protein level were associated with lower throat rule breaking and total behavioral problems, giving the observer association. Next, next slide, please. Giving the observer association, we select IMP metabolite, serum BDNF level, and flow behavioral problem for the mediation analysis. A suggested mediation role of the serum BDNF protein was found for the IMPA through problem association that accounted for a 21.5%. Next, this result in summary suggests a possible association of some of the metabolites found in the urine of the study population, IMP, the sum of all metabolites of the organ of pesticides and the ETU level with more behavioral problems, partially explained by the effect biomarker that we use it, the BDNF protein level. The more important is the possible combined effect of the pesticide with more behavior problem, with more withdrawal, with more social and with more social problem, also related with a specific methylation at the CPD3 and total CPD DNA methylation of the BDNF gene. Serum BDNF level were also associated with more throat problem and rule breaking behavior. So we cannot uh, again continue measuring a specific exposure to individual compound, but we need to change to measure the mixture of the exposure to many pesticide that the population is already exposed in the European Union, a specific among the Spanish population. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mariana. Um, it was really clear. Um, and and the, the, the cocktail effect is really something on which we need to work um, also. I give the floor now to Fabienne Gouty, University of Bordeaux. Uh, uh, Fabienne is a researcher and social scientist with La Fabrique RGO, a research engineer uh, with the INSERM EPICEM team and an associate with INHA ETIS unit. A doctoral thesis proposes a construction of pesticide risk prevention that takes into account the concern of working people in occupational health policies in the form of extended research communities. The aim of her work is to improve the living and working conditions of professionals by developing their personal and collective power to act. So Fabienne, uh, you have the floor for 15 minutes. I don't see Fabienne. And I don't hear her. Uh, Fabienne is joining any second now. She had some problems with connection, but she is joining. Okay. We are waiting for her. 
Yeah, we can wait a few seconds. And if she is not here, then we can. Oh, she, here she is. Okay. Perfect. Fabienne, you have the floor. Fabienne, can you hear us? Yes. Okay, I have the floor, but I was supposed to start at 11. It's not at 11 and 5. Okay. Okay, oh, but it's okay. We because normally in the program uh, we 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 had the, the commission, but unfortunately the commission is not there. So okay, no problem. Work, perfect. Then you have the word. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Sure. Sorry. Just let me up. Just do one thing okay, like that, and I share that. Okay. Let's go. So, uh, okay, I put it just like this. Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Fabien Gouty. I prepared this presentation with uh, Alan Garigou. We are ergonomics researcher and professor. Um, my point today will be about the critical approach of the role of personal protective equipment, the PPE, in pesticide resistance. Um, Okay, so in France, uh, the health consequences of agricultural pesticides exposure have grown an increasing concern and become a sensitive and um, political and media issue. Several public reports like the National Institute of Health and Medical Research, um, National Agency for Food, Environmental and Occupational Health and Safety, uh, calling ANSES, and National Institute of Health and Medical uh, Research shown that um, high likelihood that these pesticides contribute to the appearance of several neurological illness, cancers like uh, Parkinson's disease, prostate cancer, malignant non-Hodgkin lymphoma, including multiple um, myeloma. And uh, in this context, the personal protective equipment, the PPE, is central in discussion of chemical waste prevention in agriculture. Um, sorry, I have to do one thing like this. From the answers, so um, um, from one agency report that we, we, we um, that some colleagues uh, um, prepare, and to the safety science public, uh, sorry, it's not working, okay. So um, this report at the left of, of the, the screen is about the occupational exposure to pesticides in agriculture. Um, the main of this report is to better understand and reduce exposure in the context where the available data are currently often lacking um, and is documenting exposure inside the real work. Uh, after this report, uh, with some colleagues, international colleagues from France, Brazil, Canada, um, we prepare and multidisciplinary or also economics, ergonomics, epidemiologists, we prepare uh, this article that you can find in Safety Science about the critical review of the role of PPE in the prevention of risk related to the agricultural pesticide of use. It's what is inside this article and how we prepare it that I will um, explain to you today. Uh, just to uh, let have um, a view of what is PPE, I, I, uh, I put this, um, this figure, this uh, pictures of uh, some uh, um, of the 30 uh, kind of model we can find in the French market uh, in uh, agricultural use. So three points I will to defend today, the place of PPE in prevention, that one of the fundamental principles of the occupational health and safety is that PPE should be considered as the last line of defense after other the measures have been taken, after um, we plus the risk, after having um, um, done many things, it will be the last line. And the uh, ILO, uh, International Labor Organization, showed that, and a European Directive uh, take it also. And um, PPE is not the same that collective protection, that you will use some, um, uh, not the same thing in, to uh, um, the body of the, of the person. So collective protection system should be put in place before PPE. The second point is that 
were in PP, um, uh, central to marketing authorization procedure. If the exposure level esti estimate that uh, with model is greater than the acceptable operator exposure level, the models that we use to register pesticide predictively consider that the estimated exposure value could be reduced by wearing PPE. When data on the protection provided by PPE is lacking, the European Food Safety Authority recommends using default values in this case, considering that coverals let's look a maximum of five or ten percent of the product to which users are exposed, I let you uh, have a look of uh, this EFSA guidance. Well, you will see how we, um, how okay we um, sorry, <laughs> um, about I, I I let you just uh, have a look, and you can find it uh, online also. The, second, the first point is about the exposure modelization. That here, the pictures that you have is the field studies where PPE wearing practices were uncontrolled, meaning means that the choice of the PPE or whether to use any at all was not imposed to the agriculture. But, sorry, it's not working. And I have this. This bar that avoid me to okay. Uh, so all the report and for the registration, the field study in which PPE were in practice are controlled, requiring that the particular kind of PPE be worn. Here on the left, you can see that how this people the this man is uh, what he's wearing and also personal clothes um, to have a look inside the cube. Uh, to prepare pesticide, you need to have some information. And on the left, on the right side, you can uh, see an agriculture in on side the, um, the 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 tractor, the the, the sprayer um, to intervene during spraying uh, because you you cannot um, uh, regulate uh, the sprayer without going on <laughs> during the spraying. Okay. Here. And here, this figure represents the median contamination and the distribution. The most striking finding is the large overlap in the distribution of contamination values for people wearing protective clothing and who's done, who did not. Thus, in some cases, these people wearing clothes could have higher contamination than people not wearing it. Data processing very far leads to several considerations. Wearing protection clothing does not completely prevent contamination. And during the preparation phase, wearing a suit partially limits contamination, but does not completely prevent it. And also during the treatment and cleaning phases, people who wore coveralls were generally more contaminating than was, uh, was who did not. So external contamination in relation to whether coveralls are worn. Sorry for this interruption. Assessment of PPE effectiveness in failed study in which PPE wearing practices are uncontrolled or partially, partially controlled. The coveralls typically recommended by prevention organization are not to be tested for resistance to permeation by the pesticide being used, which explains how some products migrate through the coverall, some within 10 minutes. The products used to test the coverall resistant to permeation were acids and bases commonly used in industry. They match products that the norm suggests for PP testing, but do not respond to the characteristic of pesticide on the market. I propose this discussion, the possibility of Having PP what that is comfortable, suitable to practical condition, affordable, and protects from contamination by any and Holland lead products has yet to be demonstrated. Numerous studies have found significant gaps between the ideal theoretical model that I present before and the reality, reality of work and of our workers. 
There is no mechanism allowing systematic monitoring of the feasibility and actual effectiveness in the post-marketing conditions of the protection provided by PPE as they are postulated in marketing authorization procedures. Data is still incomplete, fragmentary, and scattery. Also, studies in which PPE wearing practices are uncontrolled, PPE does not always fulfill the protective role attributed to it in the marketing authorization procedures, in the registration. There is many determinants that could influence the efficiency of recommendation based on PPE use. In this, it is essential that evaluation of this efficiency include the full range of active use conditions people concern and actual practices. Advances in toxicology look, on the effect of the low doses and development in chemical technologies with the emergence of the nanomaterials inside the pesticide, inside the product, call for a radical re-examination of the role that PPE can play in preventing chemical risk. Conclusion. PPE's protective abilities are overestimated in the marketing authorization process or during prevention intervention. Exposure scenarios should take full account of the difficulties that we call, that could potentially be encountered in the real use in, in the field, for, for example. That kind of lessons for preventing pesticide exposure in the context of climate change is the question I ask it to you. And I prepared just three pictures because I think I have time. You confirm to me, just three pictures, or I, yeah. I... yes, you can, Fabienne. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so some reason of the non-use of PP by agriculture is not that they are just uh, ignorant. Is not the point. Field observation, even in OCD countries, show that the actual wearing of PP is well below stipulated recommendation. All thought is variety according to type of the task. For Worky, which come with greater subordination of work and make it for more difficult to demand that the employer provide them with adequate training and PPE. Because before we, we see just um, agricultural uh, owners of the farm, but uh, also you have some salaries, some migrant doing this kind of work and having to be protected during the use of pesticide. The role of employers and the nature of working relationships, non-use of PPE in agriculture may be interpreted as a resulting in part from very different risk aversion profile. And last slide about the potential user complaint of several characteristics of PPE, thermal and mechanical discomfort. Many times you cannot see well what you are doing when you, when you use this thing and you are stressed and also you have to wear uh, thing uh, with the sun, etc. Negative image also with the neighborhood of PPE among neighboring non-farming population and burden and significant expense of respecting all instruction for use. Here, the last photo, uh, I as I was talking to you before about the, the, the sun and what you can do when it's very uncomfortable and uh, when you hurt it, it's so high because you are you're you are drying uh, on the sun. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fabienne. And it's really concerning when you said that sometimes wearing PPA is more dangerous than not wearing it. Um, and so, and also the fact that uh, sometimes uh, the legislation is using uh, PPA um, to as um, a market access for uh, hazardous uh, pesticides. So it's really something that we have to have in mind when we discuss about uh, this in the regulation. So thank you very much, Fabienne. Um, I give now the floor to Jobian Wind. Jobian is a policy and advocacy officer of the Dutch Parkinson Disease Association. She studied uh, molecular science in uh, Wageningen uh, and received a PhD in psychological and chemistry of the University of Utrecht and worked as a postdoc in the lab with glyphosate. So um, you have the floor for 15 minutes, uh, Jobien. Thank you for giving me the floor. Um, I have Parkinson's disease. 
at this moment I'm a bit stressed, so I took an extra pill and now I'm moving around. That's all part of the the, the Parkinson's disease. Next slide, please. Uh, I'd, I'd like to dedicate this uh, speech to Marina Noordgraaf. Uh, she is a, she made this presentation. She died last year, aged 53. She was the motor, the brain, and the creator behind our research on Parkinson's and pesticides. We miss her. Next one. Next slide, please. This is one of the drawings in which she couples the uh, pesticides to um, Parkinson's. Next slide. Parkinson's disease is more than uh, an old man with shaking hands. That's what people think. It's a, it's a debilitating disease with motor symptoms as well as those other ones like um, physiological impairments. Sorry, I have to do something with my text. Physiological impairments like apathy, depression, anxiety, or um, it causes social problems through a change in personality or stigmas because of walking and being called a drunk. Problems with stress, not being able to multitask or even a double task like uh, talking and managing my uh, uh, presentation. It, uh, PD is the um, fastest growing neurological disease and it's chronic and progressive. It's not a, a cure in sight yet. Uh, it's a disease of loss upon loss. One loses functions like smell, writing, walking, speaking, swallowing, and yeah, it keeps on bringing new losses. Next, uh, in my, oh, well, we think it's a, a man-made disease because it, it only came up in the Industrial Revolution. The cause uh, is probably caused by heavy metals, chemicals like pesticides, but also trichloroethylene. This also appears to be an hereditary um, component and a multi multi-factor disease. Uh, to explain the multi-factor, I'd, I'd like to tell you my story. Next slide, please. In my teens, I earned my first cassette deck, uh, Peeling Bulbs. And I uh, did I did not know that, that, lot, that lots of pesticides were used in bulb growing. The red doors signify changes in my future. Next slide. Peeling bulbs colored a few doors red. At, when I was 32 or 34, I worked in a, in a lab as a postdoc using glyphosate on a daily basis. This resulted in more red doors. Next slide. Then my mother turned up with a, um, sorry, I have to do something. Oh, I can't. So. Then my mother, mother turned out to have PD just like her mom and bingo, my lottery ticket was delivered. Next slide. Why am I? Am I here, and why are we so so active with um, the Parkinson's Association? It, it's a member organization. We bring the patient voice. And next slide, please. On national television, uh, there was a there was a made a link between uh, pesticides and agriculture uses of uh, some pesticides. It was told by his son. Uh, by the son of the farmer, and it, it takes place in a village in the Netherlands where there are lots of uh, um, people with pesticides, and they were linked to. Um, uh, sorry, we we aided. The, you see, this is what happens when I when I'm talking and doing other things at the same time. I want, I want to tell you uh, a story of, of Eva, with the, the voice of Eva. I got my, yes, sorry, I, I lost the story, well. Eva, I got my, P, my Parkinson's diagnosis when I was 49. No one in my family has had PD. I was born in 1961 and my mother worked for farmers during harvests of fruits and vegetables. 
between uh, 1962 and 1967, my mother took me with her. I remember picking up strawberries and digging potatoes. I played on the field. I must have put stuff in my mouth once in a while. I imagine that the impact of pesticides on a small body is much bigger than on grown-ups. Well, next, what we did was um, to, to prove the point is uh, we read a, a pile of literature in 2019 and came up with three conclusions. And the biggest problem uh, with pinpointing specific pesticide causing Parkinson's disease is the long exposure after the long time after exposure and the appearance of symptoms. It could take five to 50 years after exposure before the right diagnosis is made. Uh, the first studies thus were uh, epidemic epidemiological studies in Canada or in, lots of them in the States, showing a correlation between working with pesticides and getting PD. Next slide, please. Exposure to uh, pesticides ex increases the chances of getting Parkinson's disease. Con next, for every two people who contract Parkinson's anyway, one extra gets PD from working with pesticides. So it's an increased chance. Uh, the second conclusion, next. Exposure to pesticides uh, hastens the age of onset of Parkinson's. Next. People with uh, Parkinson's disease who have been chronically exposed to pesticides in the past. Next have on average con contracted the disease five years earlier than their non-exposed Parkinson colleagues. Prolonged exposure to pesticides after diagnosis hastens the severity of Parkinson's disease. So not only you get it earlier, but if you continue to use uh, the, the pesticides, you'll be getting much worse rapidly. Um, yes. Um, where are you? Conclusion three, the two most commonly used pesticides in the Netherlands have neurotoxic effects. I'll focus today on glyphosate, the active component of Roundup, but the second one was Mancosep. Mancosep was uh, forbidden recently in, in 2021, but it was 20, 20 years too late. Already in 2001, si solid scientific evidence emerged from the Ramazzini Institute that is harmful to our health. It took 19 years to get banned. The effects of Mancosap will become noticeable in the coming years in growing uh, Parkinson's disease numbers. Next, back to glyphosate. All the drawings are from Marina. Um, glyphosate affects the zebrafish memory and makes the fish passive. Glyphosate is linked to places of Parkinsonism and glyphosate leads to health effects in future generations of rats that have never been exposed themselves. Next, glyphosate changes uh, the intestinal flora of bees and increases susceptibility to disease and death. Glyphosate leads to a different composition of the intestinal bacteria in mice, rats, and chicken as well. This leads not only to vulnerable health, but also to anxious and depressive behavior, just as uh, what happens in um, people with pesticides in their guts. Most of them have well, uh, symptoms, either an early symptom or a, a later symptom of disrupt disruption of the microbiome. Uh, next, well, well, what, what do we do as Parkinson's Association in, in Dutch? We, collect, we collected stories from people who suspected that their disease is um, partly caused by pesticides. We link these uh, stories to media to give newspaper articles and broadcasts a real, realistic uh, patient level content. I dare say that, a, that, a, that there's a lot of intention now because we brought in the, 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 the health angle well, of course, also we are we are somewhat involved in, in the political lobby, and what we want to do is to prevent as much new cases of Parkinson as possible. So, 
it's a man-made disease, so maybe we can turn it around and um, find a man-made cure and don't, don't do all the things we did why people get um, uh, Parkinson's. The last question is, well, why do we continue to use pesticides we can't prove to be not harmful? Yeah, the, the, we, can't measure, we can't measure it. So while we wait for our governments to decide on our health, do we know that we are sufficiently protecting the vulnerable? I, I end with the last story, Hank, of Hank. This is my story. I, in my youth, I was 15 to 16 years old. I only worked for six weeks for a lily grower. I sincerely, sincerely doubt that my exposure to poison was only minor. I think it was huge. In warm weather, we used to work without a shirt to get a tan. And cooling behind the, stray, the spraying tractor was delightful. But the, so in hindsight, I both inhaled the pesticides and was exposed by skin contact. I do not know the spraying agents that were used. I was diagnosed when I was 29 years old and I've had PD for 18 years. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jobin, for this uh, testimony, but also for the work you are doing uh, in uh, Parkinson uh, uh, Disease Association. So I think it's really important to have this testimony with us today. Uh, and I, I exactly ask the same question when we are working on uh, sure legislation. Uh, why are we using these hazardous uh, chemicals? Um, and, and why some people uh, in this parliament are continuing to defend these products um, on the field. So it's really something that we, we have to, to continue to fight uh, against um, as politicians, but also as NGOs and as testimony as you are uh, in your association. So thank you very much. Um, I give now the floor to Konstantinos Makris, uh, Konstantinos is an associate professor of environmental health at the Cyprus International Institute for Environmental and Public Health within the Schools of Health Science at Cyprus University of Technology. He has produced over more than 120 peer-reviewed journal articles and more than 70 conference proceedings, and he was one of the two investigators that conducted the cancer cluster investigation for the Astrasol brain cancer court case in Cyprus. So thank you for your fight. Thank you for your work. And we are listening to you for 15 uh, minutes too. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Arena, for the invitation and also for the PAN organizers of this very important uh, webinar. It's my pleasure to be here with you today. I uh, would like also to congratulate uh, Mrs. Wynn for her courage, her patience, and her continuing efforts to inform people and protect the vulnerable SSS. I'm going to concentrate on that aspect and my presentation is going to be focused primarily on children's health as a very important vulnerable subpopulation group of our society. So I will start by that uh, next please, uh, that I have no conflict of interest and uh, please uh, next I would like also to give you a small synopsis of my talk. I will start first by discussing a little bit the over the decades accumulating evidence of pesticide health effects, particularly on children's health. I will continue with some gaps in exposure assessment that uh, prevent us from getting closer to the true, uh, I would say, fingerprints of the environmental origins of disease, neurological disease or other diseases. And then I'm going to share with you some uh, very recent and uh, novel results on uh, children population from Cyprus. Uh, you see that pesticide exposures in Europe are not homogeneous distributed and appears that there are some countries or some geographical areas that appear to be particularly high risk for pesticide exposures. And I will try to give also some uh, uh, messages of hope and uh, future steps with respect to the European farm to fork uh, strategy and how we can control and prevent these risks that are associated with these pesticide exposures. Next, please. So 
Despite all this uh, accumulating evidence of the health effects of pesticides, we realize even nowadays that over the years, pesticide sales continue to increase worldwide, and in particular, pesticide mixtures. And uh, this also comes along with uh, scientific evidence that show, for example, some controversial pesticides like glyphosate and its met metabolite, AMPA, that we don't have much evidence about it, particularly for children. Whatever data we have from studies that measure both glyphosate and its primary metabolite, AMPA, we see that urinary levels of glyphosate in children are higher than adults. And we also have some data also for its uh, metabolite. Next, please. So some of the pioneering uh, studies worldwide about the pesticide health effects have, uh, are coming from the US, from the California Valley, where about half of uh, US fruits and vegetables are produced in that relatively small valley, where Professor Eskenazi was inspired to set up this Tsamakos Children Cohort Study, from which there are numerous studies that came out. You can see the citations below, and uh, they have actually shown that higher organophosphate pesticide exposures during pregnancy can result in a series of neurodevelopmental disorders. And you can see here also some visual MRIs that show how the children's uh, brain can actually be impacted by the exposure of uh, pesticides. Next, please. These are some actual results that for a series of neurodevelopmental cognition and behavior aspects that relate to pesticide exposure, pesticide exposure on the x-axis and on the y-axis we see a series of neurodevelopmental outcomes. See for example the IQ score, how it declines as children are exposed to, to more uh, pesticides. Basically this is relates to the prenatal exposures of their mothers. Next please. And the childhood is a very critical life stage that we should pay attention, just like Professor Fernandez also mentioned for the Spanish uh, birth cohort. So I will mention here that in addition to the adult exposures and the personal protective gear issues that also were presented before, uh, children may be passively or unintentionally exposed to a series of pesticides when their parents, for example, return home or if parents take their kids together in the field, just like uh, Miss Wind showed before, and just like this is a very common practice, for example, in Africa, where parents will take their kids to the field where they are unprotected and they are very much uh, exposed to pesticides from uh, uh, mouth to, to hand activities. And the Barker hypothesis that was formulated back in the early 2000s has actually shown that the children's organism is a very plastic and sensitive to its environment and all the biological programming that occurs in childhood that refers to the to the growth of various tissues organs and biological systems these processes can be actually perturbed or altered in the presence of external threats and stimuli like pesticides or other environmental stressors. And in particular, the children have this increased susceptibility, sensitivity, you may call it, because of the rapid development and because of differences, first of all, in behaviors, and secondly, in the capacity of metabolizing pesticides. For example, key detoxifying metabolizing enzymes in the liver of children are not up to the full capacity that they're usually encountered in adults. Therefore, the children's body cannot uh, metabolize and detoxify, allow me to say, uh, to the same rate like adults do for a suite of uh, pesticides. And to this extent, there are various studies that show how the risk trajectory for altering, reducing, for example, lung function that contributes to diseases like asthma, bronchitis, pneumonia, etc. can be altered due to environmental stressors in that particular age period of children. This is also the case. Next, please. 
This is also the case for other relevant health outcomes that appear in uh, childhood. Next, please. Which relates also to the risk of obesity. And you see here that they took data from two years old and they tried to project it and predict what will be the risk of obesity accounting for a suite of environmental factors. And you see here that during the first five years of children's life, you see some increase in the risk of obesity. But then uh, during the primary school years, you see a much steeper increase in that risk of obesity. And as the child uh, enters the adulthood, you can see how this risk can increase. So this is a very strong, I would say, evidence that shows how important is that childhood period and how we should pay attention to these aspects. Next, please. Okay, it looks like that somehow the, it doesn't look very good, the title here. Anyways, so these are, I took this uh, from a very important European Environment Agency report that tried to summarize the evidence that we have from a suite of studies worldwide about the effect of pesticides on a suite of different target organs and systems. With red, you can see that it means that we have strong evidence of the pesticides health effects, and this is particularly evident for the brain and neurological system. There are also some suspected scientific, suspected effects that come with evidence of pesticide effects on childhood leukemia or other cancer sites, and also on the endocrine system development. Next, please. So coming to our study that we conducted in Cyprus, we wanted basically to determine the association between pesticide exposures and some specific validated biomarkers of DNA damage and also lipid oxidative damage in primary school children. We focused on these biomarkers of oxidative damage because we consider this as important early stage precursors, allow me to say, for a suite of chronic diseases that are associated with inflammatory or oxidative stress and tissue damage biological processes. Next, please. So to this extent, we focus on the Cypriot case for why Cyprus, basically, as you can see here on the figure, this comes from the EFSA annual reporting. Cyprus is one of the top three European countries with the highest percentage of pesticide residues in foods. And this is actually historical evidence that appears during the last at least 10 years. As you might see here on top, Cyprus is second uh, from the top countries. This is a, a historic trend. And to this extent, the European Farm to Fork strategy would, be, would help to reduce pesticide use to the benefit of the environment and human health. Next, please. So the methods, next please, that we used for this study, we employed the baseline data set of, a, of the organic life randomized control trial we did with children in Cyprus. And the study was actually aligned with the European Human Biomonitoring Initiative, the HBM4EU, towards collecting harmonized pesticide data for children's health with European wide coverage. We recruited 191 children in Cyprus. Next, please. And to this extent, we administered questionnaires for various relevant confounders, various relevant variables that are associated with biomarkers of exposure to pesticides and also the biomarkers of oxidative damage that I mentioned earlier. Next, please. So the urinary biomarkers of exposure to pesticides that were measured in two laboratories for a suite of pesticides like glyphosate, its primary metabolite, TCPY, and some other pyrethroid-based metabolites. Next, please. We also analyzed uh, two validated biomarkers of effect. The first one is uh, the lipid damage biomarker, and the second one is the DNA damage biomarker. Next. So next, uh, let's go to the results. These are some descriptive characteristics of our population. The age, the mean age of our children was about 11 years old. 
both of the parents had half of them at least a university college degree. The, I would say the majority of the children uh, had a normal weight, but more than 23% of them were overweight and or obese. For some reason, it cuts the presentation. I can't see all the, the, the whole slide, but anyways, please proceed with the next one. Next, please. So, sorry, one, one back, please. Thank you. These are some results of to showcase that we indeed measured higher pesticide exposures in Cyprus and also in Spain compared to other European countries and also for American and also Canadian or other third country similar by monitoring initiatives for similar children age group. You can see here on top, for example, the 3PBA, which is a biomarker of exposure to pyrethroids and the TCPY, which is a biomarker of exposure to chlorpyrifos, were among the highest those reported in all other biomonitoring initiatives. Next, please. And the regression models we developed for all the pesticide metabolites and biomarkers of exposure to pesticides with the two biomarkers of oxidative damage, the 8 iso isoprostein to the left and the genotoxicity DNA adduct marker here. You can see that AMPA in the bottom here to the right was the one that was fairly significant associated with the genotoxicity marker showing a specific, I would say quite selective response with respect to this genotoxicity marker. But this was not true for the lipid oxidative damage marker. The glyphosate was not statistically uh, significantly associated with these uh, biomarkers. Next, please. So the overall key study findings that was published in the Environmental Research uh, Journal, this was actually the first children's health study globally that focused on the association between glyphosate and its metabolite with oxidative damage markers. And this is the first children's health data set that presents some evidence of AMPAS the glyphosate's metabolite uh, association with oxidative stress and tissue damage. This was not the case for the parent glyphosate compound. These pesticide metabolites were associated with genotoxicity marker. And obviously, we need more data to better understand and try to replicate the trends ob observed in this study. Next, please. Now, Having this knowledge in mind, what can we do to reverse this health risk by reducing these exposures or maybe control these exposures in children? To this extent, we have published results from the Organico randomized control trial in Cyprus, where you can see to the left how the body burden of pesticides by focusing, let's say, on a validated urinary biomarker of exposure to pyrethroids can be lower this body burden when children switch the diet from a conventional one with this light green color to the organic uh, diet with this stronger green color. You can see the reduction in the levels of this pesticide metabolite in children's urine when they switch to the organic diet. And then when they go back to the conventional diet, you see the anticipated increase in the levels of pesticides in children urine and in the other group where children started first with their conventional diet and then crossed over to the organic food treatment you can see clearly that the body burden of this with respect to this pesticide was significantly reduced obviously it's not going to go to below limit of detection but this reduction is a significant one and in addition to this, we also showed that these biomarkers of oxidative stress and inflammation were also reduced when children switch the diet from the conventional uh, one to the organic one using mixed effect linear regression models. Next, please. 
So this uh, case study in Cyprus was actually included in a briefing by the European Environment Agency that we demonstrated the, the impact on reducing children's exposure to pesticide by providing organic food in Cypriot schools. And we also did a cost effectiveness analysis by showing that this organic food implementation in school meals can be actually a cost effective one for the countries or the regions that they would like to undertake such an intervention. Next, please. And this is one of the two, three slides and I'm finishing. So we also submitted a health claim dossier to the European Food Safety Agency for the organic food benefits to protect children cells from oxidative damage because we believe this is very relevant for uh, children's health and development. And to this extent, as you can see here, the EFSA replied negatively because um, the, the response was that the organic food was not well characterized and also the fact that the European Food Safety Agency currently, with respect to the health claim application evaluation, does not have the legal requirements to evaluate and characterize a food not only on its nutritional attributes but also on its food contaminant attributes. This is something what we were actually applying in our case because the main argument behind the organic food benefits is that with the organic food we basically lower the pro-inflammatory and the pro-oxidative damage potential of conventional food because of the pesticides that conventional usually uh, include. Next, please. So with respect to the policy implications, a question here that I would like to put on the table is that we need, as a European Union, to consider whether we're going to follow the policy that has been usually the case for the United States, where they going to ban, they ban a few pesticides every one or two decades for which you have major scientific evidence. And at the same time, we are continuing to introducing newer active ingredients or formulation mixtures in the market. This is, I believe, the policy that the United States have been uh, using quite in the years. But European Union with a farm to fork uh, strategy comes, I believe, with a different strategy. And we have the evidence now, I believe, both with the observational studies that uh, Professor Fernandez showed, other cohorts, and also the randomized control trials that show that pesticide use and human exposure to pesticides can be controlled. We have the tools. Now it's the time to facilitate the uptake of these tools by the market, from farm all the way to the fork. So this much needed paradigm change for pesticide use can be a, indeed accomplished over time gradually by offering incentives to farmers and at the same time we need to account both for the technical constraints and also the social and economic constraints of related interventions. And last but not least, uh, next please, I would like to thank my team at uh, the Cyprus International Institute and also the collaborators that were a part of the original publication. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Konstantinos, um, for this very interesting presentation and uh, results. Um, as uh, MEP Maria Arena had to leave to uh, another meeting, I will uh, take over the chair. Thank you also very much for this, to the speakers for sticking, sticking to your speaking times and leaving a little, little bit of time for uh, the Q&A session. So in the chat, we had a few questions. Uh, one was about uh, harmonized risk indicators. This is less directly linked to uh, uh, human health, but uh, very briefly. Um, the, currently, the European Commission is measuring the evolution of the pesticide use and risk using an indicator called harmonized risk indicator. 
uh, which is under discussion and might be uh, reformed because there is a series of issues uh, with this indicator um, that, uh, for instance, makes it that when you use pesticides less toxic, but with higher quantities like the ones used uh, in organic agriculture, it looks like the situation is getting worse and worse. Um, so less toxic pesticides seem uh, more toxic uh, following the current way it is measured. And yesterday the commission published the evolution of the uh, use and risk of pesticides following using these indicators that have a, a fundamental flaw and we are trying to, uh, to work on it. And there is quite some consensus among the commission and the council and uh, some political parties in the parliament that it needs to be reformed. Um, then there was a question um, quite specific. Uh, is uh, there any evidence on the combination of exposure between DMI fungicides and insecticides such as uh, imidacloprid, which now is fortunately banned um, among children? Does anyone, can anyone uh, answer, Marietta or Constantinos? Do you have any information on? Uh, evidence of impact on such combination? I see nobody's taking the floor. Um, indeed, it is, yes, Marietta? No, I don't have a, a, an answer, <laughs> sorry. <Yes. laughs> I expected that. It, it is indeed extremely difficult to transpose uh, results we have with insects where it's easy in laboratories to um, make combined exposures and indeed there are many um, evidence uh, that uh, a combination of uh, not only DMI, DMI fungicides but one uh, different categories of fungicides and uh, insecticides have a, a very very high toxicity to insects uh, but we can of course uh, not do that so easily with humans. Uh, Florian, do you want to um, um, elaborate a little bit, very shortly, your question? Yeah, so one moment. <clears throat> For me, it was not, uh, not the, the specific combination of the MI fung fungicide and ni nicotinoids, whereas the MI fungicide inhibit the um, enzymes which detoxify, uh, cause the detoxification, and this combination make it about 10,000 times more toxic for bumblebees, but um, my, my question was more, is there any combination now which cause something like that in children? Because if you um, have a full basket of vegetables, you have a full basket of different types of um, pesticides, which may cause a comparable um, effect for the children. May I answer? Uh, yes. Yeah. The problem is that the the nine of com the number of combination that we can assess in the lab is too high, so it's it's not possible to assess all of them. Um, so the only way that we already have is to put the uh, different metabolite that we found in human uh, fluid and try to make combination, mathematical combination or a bio market, biological market to assess that specific combination because maybe you are talking of a specific one, but we are missing another important one. So the, the way is, who knows, everyone has a different combination of the different uh, pesticides depending on the, the lifestyle, the uh, place where they live. So it's not possible to assess all the possible combination regarding human exposure and health. Thank you. And I think this is also precisely one of the reasons behind the, the commission proposal to have a 50% reduction for all pesticides because um, assessing the combinations of pesticides and identifying which ones are the most toxic is, uh, is really difficult. Um, there is a question, um, it's a question to Fabienne Guti, but uh, actually it's one that can be asked to, to all the speakers. Oui, I'm here. Yes, um, so Fabienne, what is the, uh, the results of your work? Have you communicated them to uh, public authorities and also to the industry? 
and what was uh, their reaction um, um, and the follow up on your work? Okay, we'll switch in uh, in in English. Sorry, up up. Okay, uh, yeah, the, the professor Alan Garrigou, Isabel Baldi, are presented at the French authorities uh, the, these results. And um, the report answers uh, I was uh, presenting to you at the, at the first, uh, it's uh, uh, governmental. So uh, they, they take in count that. And, uh, but for the moment, um, uh, pesticides <laughs> follow to be uh, authorized register. Uh, uh, with the need of uh, to wear uh, a PP. <laughs> so, okay, I think uh, uh, we need, like, uh, we start with the um, media uh, to diffuse that um, uh, more larger than just with authorities to have the, the public uh, civil, uh, the population uh, uh, with this. Wonder, yes. yes, this is uh, very often the case. The information is there, but then it needs to be uh, disseminated and, and a civil society needs to uh, use it to, to have changes in policies. Um, thank you. Um, Marietta, do you, did you communicate the results of your findings with the Spanish authorities? Of course, <laughs> uh, most of our projects are funded by the European Union or the national uh, authorities. So uh, it's an obligation to uh, send all the paper that are um, uh, gathered with that kind of funding as a result. And uh, we are very um, uh, in favor to present not only the data to the uh, authorities, but also to the um, general public, uh, even because we are obtaining a biological sample of population and we somehow need to translate that kind of information. It's not easy to translate this kind of information to the general population because uh, in one hand, people, people are on alarm because as you uh, could see, most of them are exposed to many of pesticides, the only one. So the we measure eight, um, usually people have between four and seven uh, different metabolites. So the first um, reaction is, oh my God, what I, I am in my body. But this is a very normal thing. And the other thing is the difficulties to associate exposure to uh, effect, effect. So some key um, measure had been present through the webinar as Constantino uh, presented. The time of exposure is very important. Um, when children and the pregnant mother are exposed, the effect could be higher and more important. Another key measure was present by Jovic Wine that the long delay between the exposure and the disease. So it's not a COVID uh, situation where you are exposed to a, a virus and the effect is coming uh, soon. So usually, uh, even we need to wait another generation in order to, to get the, the problem. Um, people also think that because we are um, um, uh, putting some uh, uh, regulation um, uh, approach, uh, for example, because crop reform is already prohibited in Europe, we don't have any more a problem with crop reform. Concrete was using for more than 40 years. So people had been exposed for a long period of time. So the problem is not finished, it's not end because it's not uh, allowed to use in, in our country. So just be, uh, take this kind of measure, uh, home measure, because they are very important one in order to uh, um, uh, somehow to uh, fix the problem. As uh, you already say, it's impossible to answer all the questions. So reduce the exposure is one of the more important ones. 
Thank you, Marietta, and I apologize for the last questions uh, and also not giving the floor to uh, the speakers because uh, it's already uh, eleven fifty-seven. And for uh, the sake of uh, respecting everybody's time, I will need to conclude uh, first to uh, thank very much the speakers for the high quality of your presentation. Uh, I think it is very convincing that uh, we need an overall reduction of pesticides to, to pr protect uh, citizens' health, including through the food, as uh, was uh, mentioned by Konstantinos. Uh, and also, before I forget them, a big thank you to the interpreters that, that we never see, but that do a fantastic job to allow to disseminate the information um, to more people. Uh, thank you also to my colleagues uh, for making this uh, webinar a reality, uh, to Agili Kilistimach and Natalia Spretan and my, our communication team also working uh, in the shadow. We didn't see them, unfortunately. Um, well, we heard a lot about scientific evidence that is there. It's new evidence, but there's also a lot of old, old evidence uh, the work of the scientists is extremely important because as the political system works in Europe, uh, we need a lot of scientific evidence to have changes in, in, in policies because unfortunately the precautionary principle is not implemented as we would like it to be. So please continue with the good work and continue communicating on it. Um, the presentations also allowed us to, to highlight the fact that Currently, the risk assessment, the evaluation of the toxicity of the pesticides is insufficient to allow for chronic and long-term uh, toxicity ev evaluation, yeah. in particular, the neurotoxic, neurotoxicity of pesticides, yeah. or the impact of pesticides on obesity, as we saw through uh, their en endocrine disruption. Um, and also, um, it was touched upon the, the fact that uh, the exposure to mixtures of pesticides is not assessed, not taken into account. There is no safety factor applied. Um, you might not know it, but normally since 2005 in EU law, the exposure to mixture of pesticides in food should be regulated. And it's still not the case because there is no political will either at EFSA level or at commission and member states level to really take this problem into account, which is uh, unacceptable. But fortunately, there are solutions. Konstantinos presented uh, the difference uh, when children, but also adults, start eating organic foods and vegetables. It has a direct impact uh, on uh, oxidative stress and exposure to pesticides. Uh, but unfortunately, people li living in rural areas are still heavily exposed. And um, we, we, we need to start implementing integrated pest management to use pesticides only as a last resort and to help farmers becoming uh, independent or less dependent uh, from the agrochemical industry. So uh, once more, thanks to everybody for attending this meeting and um, see you soon. Bye bye. Have a nice day.